fine furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces, and others like them, are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series, we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We will discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello and welcome to a new program which is part of the Woodworks series. We're calling this program Woodworks Roundtable. We've invited a panel of master craftsmen from around the county to join us to talk about issues of interest to woodworkers at all levels of skill and experience. They'll be giving us some insight to particular techniques that they use in their craft and we'll answer questions from you, the viewer, on anything that you would like some guidance, help or simply information on. In today's programme, we are joined by three craftsmen from the Santa Cruz Woodworkers, Roger Heitzman, Mickey Singer and Ron Day. The Santa Cruz Woodworkers is a collaboration of professionals dedicated to fostering appreciation for locally produced, one-of-a-kind, handmade woodwork, or as Ron Day says much more succinctly in his website, a group formed to promote the art and appreciation of woodworking. Let me introduce today's panel. First, we have Roger Heitzman, whose woodworking credentials go back to the 1970s with his degree in, Ind in industrial arts and woodworking from Humboldt State. His work over the years has focused on blending distinct visual design with high quality craftsmanship. Functional art, I think you called it, Roger. Furniture that offers a unique visual expression that enhances and transcends function. Roger has been an instructor of woodworking across the country, a guest speaker, a panelist, and an author in many fine woodworking craft and art publications. Next to Roger is Mickey Singer. Mickey came to woodworking as a second career, the first being in marine research. Mickey likes to work closely with his clients in the design of pieces that are relevant to the client, their space, and their lifestyle. Pieces that are functional, that display a high level of craftsmanship, but that also contain an insight into his own aesthetic. Examples of his work are installed in private collections around the country and have been featured in national publications and galleries on both the East and West Coasts. Ron Day has over 30 years of experience of working with clients to create fine furniture that mixes form and function. Ron's background in both art and furniture repair provide him with a foundation for original design combined with functionality. His attention to subtle detailing enhances the beauty of the natural wood and has led to his work being featured in a variety of magazines, publications, and reference material used by interior designers and other craftsmen. My name is John Hall, and I'm not famous for anything. <laughs> Other than bringing woodworks to you all in Santa Cruz County, along with our producer and technical guru, Keith Gudger. Let's get started. So gentlemen, I have a number of questions which are to do with a, a variety of woodworking topics, from design to joinery to finishing. But let's make a start with some questions that address more the fundamental characteristics of wood itself and how these affect woodworking. So the first question is to do with grain. And the question is, how do you read the grain in a piece of wood, and why is that important? Ron, would you like to take that one? Certainly. <clears throat> it's one of the most important things about furniture making. In fact, the selection of the boards used in making a piece of furniture 
is probably one of the most important steps that you can take because there's so much of a difference, even just within one species, of the, the way that the board can look, how it's taken out of the tree, and how it's um, essentially presented on a piece of furniture that really drives the design and it drives um, so many aspects of how you create the piece, how you want to show off the grain, that uh, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's sort of a foundation for how you proceed on a piece. So it's, it is uh, vitally important to know how wood uh, has different aspects, uh, like I said, and there's basically, if you look at any board, there's always going to be a face grain, an edge grain, and an end grain, right? And by looking at the end grain, you, you can always tell that how the growth rings are oriented uh, according, uh, with respect to the, the face of the board, that will be a, a strong determining factor in how the grain looks. This particular piece of vertical grain fur that I'm holding here, and if you can see the end grain, which represents the growth rings of the tree, uh, they're virtually perpendicular to the face of the board. And because of that, you get this combed, even, uniform grain that is un unique to uh, this particular species in terms of, it's, it, it's very common used for uh, like a, a lot of uh, woodworking trim and um, trim carpentry and things like that, it, even in flooring. But it's also, you can find the same thing in any wood, whether it's hardwood or softwood, because the, the grain orientation is always going to give you a different look. If you go from something like this that has this the perpendicular um, uh, or vertical grain to it and, and the re real even grain, on that piece of fur, you can go to this piece of teak, and if you look at the growth rings here, how the growth rings are sort of this flat circle, and that's called flat sawn. And so you can see the orientation, how that came out of the tree. And that gives a much different type of grain, and sometimes it can be extremely wild, and it can be much more of a, uh, a visual statement. A lot of times when I do pieces that have uh, resawn panels where you're doing a book matched cut and you, you want to show off that wonderful book matched grain, if you were to do that on this type of grain, it would be kind of boring. You have the uniform lines here and the uniform lines here and it doesn't really show it off. So in, in many cases, what you want to do if you want to really have an interesting sort of um, book match effect, the more wild the grain, the more interesting effect that you'll have. So it's a way to take advantage of that. And you literally select the boards for that particular okay. usage. So a book match effect is, is what? Well, imagine that you took a board like this, for mm -hmm. example, and you would saw it right down the length of the board. Mm -hmm. And then you take that and you open it up and you'll see two matching sort of um, mirror okay. opposites. So mirror one side opposites. is a replica, okay. <laughs> exactly. And so if you were to just, like on this board right here, if you were to just use this half of the board, it's similar to this. Mm -hmm. You can, once again, you can see the growth rings out here, how this, the growth rings here are, are closer to perpendicular, and then as it gets towards you know, this part of the tree, it's more of a wild grain. So this part here, if you do the book match pattern, tends to offer, in my opinion, a more interesting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a visual sort of, uh, it's, it's like a, a more interesting visual um, statement when you want to make a, like a, a panel or an, uh, use it to, you know, really show off yeah. the grain. And so a lot of it depends on how you take it, like I said, like how you take it out of the tree. What are the other two pieces you got here? Well, this one here is some sycamore. And this is definitely uh, an example of how when, when it comes out of the tree, this is quarter sawn and it gets a very unique pattern. And when you, uh, when you show off something like this, you definitely want to make it so that you take advantage of this. A lot of woods um, are 
really known for their specific, how they come out of the tree. Zebra wood is a classic example. It has a very unique type of combed even grain. And it, it's really known for that way of, of um, when you take it out of the tree in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Quarter sawn oak is also a perfect example. When you quarter saw it, it means that you're, you're literally slicing right through the, um, the grain is perpendicular to this face. And in oak, it has this unique sort of pattern that has these rays that give yeah, it a really beautiful. interesting. Mm -hmm. And this piece? This is a piece of, excuse me, of ash. And this sort of shows you the example of, I mean, this is pretty much right near the center of the tree. And so you get much, you know, the more of a wild grain pattern like that. And you can, you can really make use of, of something like this, this, this you know, sort of parabolic type of grain. And you can use that to, to really, like I said, use a, uh, make a visual statement. It can be really a, a centerpiece of a, a you know. All right. And I mean, there are examples and some really excellent, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of us have worked with pieces of wood where the grain is so magnificent that you just, that's what you want to do, is you just want to take that, that board and do your, your best possible job to just show it off. Mm. I mean, that's kind of like what we try and, and okay. do what we do. So grain, grain pattern then is really critical, crucial to, to the design of something. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the aesthetic um, value of, of understanding grain and grain patterns. What about the effect it has on the way that you, <clears throat> you work the wood? It, that's what I, that's yeah. what I, that's where yeah. I went when I heard the question. Yeah, was to, sure. that, to that, to that, because that, that takes me back to one of my earliest memories of when I was first learning woodworking on a little bit more of an industrial scale and I first got exposed to a joiner, which is a machine that is used to put a straight edge on, on wood and you run it across a rotary cutter. And there was a, uh, you had to learn how to read the grain to orient which direction exactly. you, you mm -hmm. ran the wood across the joiner. Mm -hmm. Same thing was when you're using a hand plane on the wood. You, you mm -hmm. need to read the grain so that you're not cutting against the grain, the, the source of that, that, uh, sure. that old uh, phrase that uh, is. So how, so how do you, how would you read that grain? There, Roger. Well, what you look for is, I mean, you, look, you think of the growth rings as, as a straight line, more or less, when it's cut through the wood. And when they start to skew into the surface, uh, you look at the piece and you try to see how the, this one is, this is pretty straight grain wood. You'd probably be okay machining it either way, but see, we have an example here of something. Here's another extremely straight grain piece. I don't think I have any that are uh, a good example of, well, actually on this piece here, you can see here on this edge where these, these grain lines are sort of, they're not parallel to the edge of the wood. They kind of skew towards it. So you want it going with the grain, you'd be going from the, uh, the, the, the large taper down to the narrow taper. So you would run a, like let's say you're machining this surface, you would run a, a hand plane in this direction. Going this way, you'd be tearing out. I was going to say, tearing so out some fibers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's what uh, you know. A lot of a lot of practice comes from. And uh, when you have a large stack of wood, and you're you're feeding it through a, a, a planer or running it over a joiner. You know, you have to go through and flip <laughs> pieces mm -hmm. quickly. You know, you're just trying to save time, and you're you're reading the grain on each piece. You to orient the piece so that it's going to go through the machine, mm -hmm. or if you're hand planing it, so that you're you're going with the grain in every every case. So mm -hmm. there's a there's the the classic definition of reading the grain for the uh, uh, technique side of. Mm -hmm. you know, Ron was very eloquently addressing the aesthetics of the, mm -hmm. of the grain. Right. Okay, so it's important then to understand the, like you say, the aesthetics of the, um, the piece that you're working on and to understand how to work that piece of wood. Is there anything else or are those the two main? You also need to, do, to know how it's going to move. And I know that might be a question for later on, but movement is all about grain orientation. Um, and that's why a quarter sawn like this is used so much in furniture because when the grain is running perpendicular like this, it's going to move in a very predictable manner. You know, the movement is caused by cells taking on water and giving back water, so they tend to expand and contract. So this board will expand and contract this way, but it really won't do anything this way. And of course, it won't go lengthways. Um, in a board like this, when these cells expand, it'll have a tendency to do that 
rather than move this way. And that's because of the orientation of these grains. These grain lines are changing as it goes. And so as they swell, they swell the board in a different way. So a board of this character in a three or four inch width won't move very much. But if you got out to eight or 10 or 12 inches, it would start wanting to cup. And so you have to know how to not only take that into account and take width changes in width into account, like if you're going to capture this as a panel in a frame, you have to make sure that you leave enough room for it to expand and contract over time, or else it'll blow itself apart. Um, and so you want to make sure that you understand where the, move, where the, the board is going to go before you start joining it together. Mm. So if the viewers rush back now and look at their dining room table, and it looks a bit, it looks a bit <laughs> like that, then they, they should start to get worried, huh? Well, they're not necessarily worried, but they should know something, you know, it, it may move over time. Which okay. is why a lot of times when you're reading articles um, and they talk about making a tabletop where you're gluing boards edge to edge, oftentimes you're told to alternate the grain so that if all the boards are cupping in one way, the whole thing's going to cup. Whereas if all the boards are cupping a little bit against each other, you'll sort of stay relatively flat. That's I, always, what sort okay. of, I always found that that was always the textbook yeah. Uh, yeah. way to do it. And, and almost never do we have that <laughs> yeah. that's true. That's uh, assuming option that because yeah. you all, you're faces. always putting the best face that's up. Right. Yes. So yeah. it's, uh, maybe if you get lucky, you might have that. Yeah. Rarely, rarely it's great that, to write, right. about, write that. It yeah. doesn't always work in, <laughs> in the real okay. world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the best argument for a tablecloth, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's why, they, it's why they started using breadboard ends. Mm -hmm. Because a breadboard end will capture the whole thing and let it move and sort of keep it stable. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you were right, Mickey. There, there, there is a question, particularly um, or specifically on uh, the way wood moves. Let's get on to that in a second. Um, can one of you talk a bit about another form of, of pattern called uh, quilted or curly? Sometimes that applies to maple, I think. I'm not sure if it applies to any other types of wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But can you talk a bit about those types of uh, configurations? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I. So, what 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 is a what is a, a curly, uh, curl, curly look maple? Curl curly grain is sort of that tiger stripe. The classic is tiger maple. Um, that's really curly maple where it's or got or fiddleback. Yeah. Or fiddleback, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it, where the grain is running this way, and you have these chatoyant stripes that are going against the grain. And what that is is the grain is waving like this. And so as light comes into the cell and then it's bounced back out, that light angle changes so it looks like it's sort of wavy underneath the surface. Yeah. And it quilting, looks like it should be a washboard or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. Quilting and, 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 is sort and, and, of an and, and, extreme and, and, version. And that's really valued, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Difficult yes. to get? Um, not necessarily difficult, more expensive to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because as, you know, in the, in the processing, the log processing plants, when they're running boards, when they see figure in them, they'll usually pull them out for mm -hmm. a you know a more expensive unit mm -hmm. as they're packing. Yeah, so, them you're so you're not going to find you're not going to find wood like that. In fact, you're probably not going to find wood like this in your local hardware retail store. No, no. not on purpose. <laughs> I mean, I've found interesting grain and interesting pattern at the local lumber yard, but that's by accident. That's mm -hmm. just a board that happened to get caught in a unit and. Right. I was the first one to see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So if you are watching this and, and want to go out and look for something like that, are there speci speciality lumber yards in, in the Bay Area that they can? Oh, of course. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what we live off of. Yeah. And they're, they range every place from Watsonville to San Jose to, you know, Berkeley, Berkeley. San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And, and so on. There, there are even places that are, that are small and, and they specialize. There's a an outfit in, uh, near the San Jose airport that he, he pretty much has, has targeted solid body guitar blanks, you know, and they have just amazing grain for something that's only about this big. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, you, you pay for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there are specialty uses for really exotic pieces of wood. And mm -hmm. so they get a chance to, 
you know, okay. sort of there pull, are also pull those aside. And... Online retailers that oh, yeah. do mm-hmm. specialty. There are some on the West Coast that, you know, you can go to their website and you can see a picture of the front and back of every board. Yeah. And it's numbered. And it's it's a great resource. You know, if mm-hmm. you're just buying a little bit, a couple of boards to do some real interesting work with, you know, detail work, I mean, you wouldn't want to buy hundreds of board feet from them, but um, that's also another option. Yeah. Most of the time, I'm sure all of us agree that you want to go and see the board in person mm-hmm. and actually select it from the, you know, the stack that's there available. And it's not unusual to go through a big stack all by yourself, <laughs> you know, wrestling these boards, um, just trying to find that, in, in some cases, just maybe one board that you're looking mm-hmm. for. And so it's sort of part of what we do. I've often <laughs> said that that part is the hardest part of it is. being a woodworker is the, the search and the acquisition <laughs> of materials. Yeah. I mean, it, you think about it, that's, that's the one sales technique that they rarely ever use is to tell you that, you know, don't bother coming up to look at our stuff because I'm sure you won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, yeah. you, you spend a lot of time driving long distances uh-huh. only to encounter the dregs. Or, yeah. you know, yeah, the, the, you, and you see some guy driving off with a truck yeah. full of wood and yeah. you go, that could have been me. Twenty you know? people have gone through that unit he already. Just took but, all the you know, I so. yeah. did a did a piece uh, in recent times where I had to drive out to Livermore to look at uh, to look at some wood. I mm-hmm. found what I was after, mm-hmm. but that was a big chance to take to drive all the yeah. way out there. Mm-hmm. But that's you have to go where it is, and yeah. it, it's not it's so inconsistent because it is you know sometimes it's good, sometimes it's mm-hmm. not. And I just finished a piece recently where I sent away from Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. to an outfit that, you know, they advertise in the back of Fine Wood Wig Mackies and places like that, and they specialized in, like, curly-figured woods. And most of the woods, the hardwoods, come from back there anyway. The nice thing is, as Mickey said, with digital photography, they'll send you an email of the boards before you actually decide to buy it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a lot different than it used to be a long time ago where you would just kind of call them up or send them a, a fax saying, here's all the details. You know, I want some of this kind of grain and mm-hmm. this type of knot. I mean, you get as specific as you can to mm-hmm. try and ensure that you get what you're after. And even then it was kind of a crapshoot. So now mm-hmm. with the digital photography, it makes it at least a little bit better when you're ordering something that you're not actually going and putting your hands on. Mm-hmm. And I know it's not unusual for you guys to, to keep a piece of wood in the workshop for, for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. An interesting Decades. piece. Decades. 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 Yeah. 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 Until you find just the right use for exactly. it. Exactly. Or, the, exactly. or that you forget that you have it. Perhaps that's too personal. I did that. <laughs> just, don't disclose your Roger. I did that just recently. It was just, uh, I'd, been search- I'd started searching for this, this veneer. Uh, Oh, that yeah. very, you know, we had some very specific requirements, and only to, as I was looking for something else in my shop, I discovered that I had the perfect veneer all along, and just had forgotten that it was there. It's, yeah. There's a lot; it piles up. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of Nothing the hardest to do with things. the memory. It just, it's the. <laughs> that's yeah, one of the hardest yeah. things is to keep yourself from buying wood, <laughs> if you don't have something to do with it. Because you know, when you run across a board that's particularly nice, you think to yourself. Oh, I got to do something with that. Yeah. And then you buy it, and then it stacks up, and it's like you're going to drown in it if mm-hmm. you don't sort of rain it back pushing in. you out of the shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've been too successful with this because time is really, uh, really racing ahead of us. Let me try one more question, and we'll have very quick answers from from all, all three of you. And I know this is a question that would deserve a, a lot longer than we can give it now. But this question was about, can you talk about how wood, move, how wood moves under different climatic conditions, and how should you take this into account when designing and constructing a project? Mickey, you touched upon that earlier. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to what you said earlier? In um, just, only, just a minute. Only in that you, know, you have to sort of take your environment into account. If, you're, if the piece is going to go back east, where there are huge humidity swings throughout the year, then you need to, you know, understand that the wood is going to move a little more and know what the properties of any specific wood, you know, what species mm-hmm. you're using to take that much, you know, maybe you have to leave a little more room for yeah. expansion and contraction okay. than you might if it was going to Arizona where okay. it's just going to shrivel sure. up and not do anything. Yeah. Are there types of wood that move more than others? 
Roger? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's some that are famous for movement, and, and others that are, you know, tremendously stable. That uh, you know, you you choose woods accordingly. Sometimes, sometimes you don't have that choice. But you know, there's certain woods like like madrone, which is a you know very prolific local wood that's everywhere in our forest, but it's terrible for its uh, its movement. In fact, it's really not milled commercially at all be no. because of that mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't dry well. It's, it it cracks and warps and splits when they try to dry it. So. You know, there's, uh, each wood is different. You know, okay. And, and presumably, and um, quickly now then, Ron, presumably you have to take this into account when you're joining pieces of wood together because if you join something together that moves more than something else, Definitely. You are, you know, you've got a problem in waiting for you. As, as uh, Mickey said uh, earlier, when let's say you're doing the, uh, some sort of door or you're doing the end of a cabinet or something like that, the traditional method is where you have a frame made up of styles and rails and that panel that's in there is essentially, it's not glued in, it's just floating. And it's, and it's in a groove and it's allowed to expand and contract within that groove. And you need to uh, make sure that you know, the, it's not gonna you know, shrink and start pulling away from the, 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 the sides of the, like where the styles are to expose you know, a crack or something. Or likewise, if it expands too much, it, we're talking about something that's glacial in its period, mm -hmm. you know, very slow, but it, if it expands and it, it can you know, pull apart the, the glue joints, so you have to allow for that. And it's, okay. it's usually something that, I mean, you, all of this stuff has, um, uh, there are charts that you can mm -hmm. look this mm -hmm. up. You know, every wood has its sort of specific amount that it expands and contracts that you can get that information. I wish we had more time, but unfortunately we're gonna to have to wrap up the program for today. We've only had time to scratch the surface of the number of topics that people are interested to know more about. But stay tuned for further shows in this series and we'll hope to cover them all in time. Thank you, Roger, Mickey and Ron for your time, insight, wit and wisdom. For more information or to contact these people directly, please take a note of their website addresses in the closing credits. If you have any questions that you would like to put to a panel of master woodworkers in a future episode of Woodworks, please email me at woodworks at sctoymakers.org. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please join us again.